Okay, the door closes, and that's our cue, I think, to start the presentation. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, the title of this talk is From Circuit Board Design to Finished Product, the Hobbyist Guide to Hardware ma Manufacturing. So what we'll learn today is basically how to make cool stuff that you made uh, by yourself. Uh, my name is Sebastian Roll. Uh, I'm educated as a chemical engineer uh, from Trondheim. Uh, started out in the oil and gas industry, pivoted to software, worked as a consultant a couple of years, and now I'm back in the oil and gas industry as a software engineer. So funny how that goes. I'm also co-founder of a small company called Byte Barista, where we do workshops, we do uh, hardware design, product development, and consulting as well. So the agenda for today looks like this. We're going to go through the steps of making um, hardware through the PCB route, which involves component sourcing, finding components, uh, designing the PCB, assembly, some experiences that we had, as well as hopefully some good demos. We have a lot of slides to go through today, so I'm going to try to make it quick. This is uh, us. We are just three friends. Uh, we all have our day jobs, but in the evening we have a lot of time on our hands and we uh, spend some time in our makerspace, Hackheim and Trondheim. Uh, it's me, Sebastian, and it's Hans Elias Josefsen and Morten Jonsen Dilla and Doug. He's the brain of the organization. Uh, this summer, we attended EuroPython, which is the biggest Python conference in, uh, in Europe, in uh, Switzerland it was. And we held a workshop for uh, some 30 attendees where we uh, used this thing that we made. And the idea was that we wanted to have a workshop where people can learn about IoT concepts uh, in as most an ex accessible way as possible. So that involves not connecting things together. You just get a device, you use your MicroPython, which is an embedded uh, la language for uh, embedded programming, and you get started. So this turned into not only a workshop, but we also had a poster session where we described the process of how we designed and produced this. And we had a full day sprint at the end where people would come and contribute to the source code that we have in our GitHub repository. So how was our, how, what did our process, our adventure look like? Usually it goes like this. You start out with a breadboard. Maybe you uh, go onwards to a proto board in the middle or a strip board. That's a little bit different. Strip board, you have rows or columns are connected. And then, um, if you get all the way through and you still have some motivation, you design your own printed circuit board. Yeah, you've probably seen this before. Maybe you've done it before. It's great to see how one component works. Um, it can get a little bit messy if you have multiple components. And it's also a little bit of a hassle if you leave your project. Some li uh, wires might come loose. It's not easy to, um, to have control over we had a presentation where we wanted to discuss uh, MicroPython as a language, and we wanted to demo it and to, to show how easy it is to get uh, stuff done with a high-level language. So we made this. There's a box that's a laser cut, and you have a display in the middle, a joystick uh, on the left, a microphone in the, at the bottom there, two push buttons, and a rotary encoder. And at the very top, you can maybe see a micro SD card. So it had a micro SD card slot as well. And we presented that in NDC Oslo 2018 and also Trondheim Developer Conference. But if you look inside, the demo gods, I think I spent all my uh, goodwill with the demo gods because this thing actually worked during the conference. But up until the, the presentation, it was really a hassle to get this thing to work because all of a sudden, one wire comes loose when you lift it up, and then you have 30 minutes of just trying to figure out where should it go, how do I use a plier, like a little tiny plier to connect it again. Uh, you see the breadboard there on the left-hand left side with a microcontroller attached. So this was not a good long-term solution. 
Um, but we tried. Um, I was a little bit naive at the start. We were uh, scheduled for a two-day workshop. And I laser cut boxes and bought a lot of components and uh, got ready for the Equinool developer conference. Uh, now, the people there are very good programmers. But if you ask them to learn a new uh, language, MicroPython, you ask them to learn how to connect this stuff together, uh, to learn all of the new components, how they work, uh, find drivers, it's an impossible task, even for two days. It's very difficult. So what we ended up with was something more like this, akin to this. You have a microcontroller. In the middle, you have a temperature sensor. And then you display the values, temperature and humidity, on a display. And you can see already there how many wires are crossing. And if you find a problem here, it's very hard to debug. Is it a connection issue? Did I get the right driver on my laptop firmware? It's very difficult. So we were scheduled for another workshop and a presentation at uh, Google DevFest in Trondheim. So we decided to take it one step further. Let's make a proto board, the second, the next step. And it looks a little bit better. We're using sensor modules here, so you just connect it directly. Uh, the proto board, you can see uh, the difference is that you solder the connections between the components beforehand. Uh, so it doesn't uh, disassemble as easily. However, it took us one to two hours to solder one of these protoboards. So it was a grueling weekend. We managed to uh, produce seven of these. And on we go to the workshop. Uh, we had our presentation. Uh, the workshop is actually it go goes much more fluently now because now people have a device in their hands and it's already connected. You start thinking about the software, about the concepts, uh, hardware concepts, and people are able to produce things much quicker. So in this image to the right, we have this controller box, which is controlling this remote uh, toy car uh, over Wi-Fi using MQTT. And it has a microphone on there, and a LED dot display, and a little buzzer. So people were able to, to uh, control it using the box, which was a lot of fun. OK. Here comes the big test. We're uh, accepted for NDC Oslo for a two-day workshop, and also for a presentation. But we figure this is, this is very difficult to do a repeatable thing, making box after box after box if there's so much manual labor. So let's design our own PCB. So um, moving away from the story a little bit, let's talk about what a printed circuit board is. It's a, a substrate uh, in the middle of a non-conductive material. It gets, gives structural strength. And the, then you have one or more copper layers. Um, and then on top of the copper layers, you have something called a solder mask, which is a thin lacquer-like uh, material made out of polymer. And that is to conduct, uh, to um, insulate on the copper, except where you want exposed copper. And then on top, you have a silk screen where you can put text. So that's kind of printing on top of the PCB. You design the printed circuit board using a dedicated uh, software, which we'll get into. Um, some of them are very expensive. Some of them are free. And it's produced in a multi-step uh, process. Uh, the last description I saw had 18 separate steps. So we're not going to go into that either. Why would you want to design a PCB? Um, the PCB holds your components together. It connects them together. And you don't have to manually uh, make the connections. You do it in the software, and then it's printed. Um, you, it allows for you to have multiple layers. So you can take one, uh, one uh, track from one component to another, and then go to the other side of the PCB, and, and then back up again if you want. Um, it allows for smaller components, very small components. And uh, it reduces the human error concept, because you have less human interaction with it. And it's surprisingly low cost. You can order five PCBs for $2 now with free shipping from China. OK. So making a PCB device, let's split it into four steps. You first want to find which component you want to use. What is the functionality I want? Then uh, you want to figure out 
how this component works. Make sure that you know how to uh, have it behave in the intended way. And then you design the PCB. At the end, you order the PCB, the components, and assemble it together. So first, finding the components. You have so many components, different types of sensors, input devices, microcontrollers. It's very hard. It's impossible to keep track. Here is a list of some of the more reputable uh, brands. Some uh, are more ob obscure brands. But you want to use a distributor in order to uh, buy these things. So the distributor, you go there to their website, you search for microphone, you get hundreds of uh, hits, and then you figure out what type of microphone do I want. Uh, and then from there, you can buy from many different manufacturers. Uh, from our experience, DigiKey and Mouser was a little bit too expensive for our hobbyist goals. Uh, Arrow is a giant company, uh, but they have decided to target the hobby market. So they offer free shipping now for one component you can buy, and they offer free shipping, which is very nice. And they have good competitive prices. LCSC is a Chinese company, and they have in, on this list the, the cheapest components that we found. Uh, we used Arrow and LCSC in our adventure. There's also something called aggregators. So if you decide, I want this microphone, I have a model number for it, you can go to Octopart or Find Chips and search for that um, model number, and you will get all the distributors that sell it. And you can choose the one with the cheapest price, if you want. OK, and then there is AliExpress, eBay. I don't have to explain, I don't think, uh, what that is. They have very, very low prices free shipping from China. I've used it uh, constantly. My girlfriend is not happy with the packages that come. <laughs> At the worst, it's multiple packages per day, but it goes in, uh, yeah, in waves. Um, you also have Alibaba Group, which is kind of like AliExpress when you want to buy 50 or 10,000 of that same thing. And what, what the thing here is, about, is that you, are, you search through AliExpress or Alibaba, and then you are put into touch with a distributor, with the sales. So that would be a smaller company, perhaps. And then you might negotiate a price with this company. So it's a little bit different. Uh, you, might get, uh, uh, you might risk getting lower quality uh, or defect items, worst case. Some of them don't ship with anti-static bags. So the, the previous slides has that more covered. But uh, I have to say, uh, we've also used Alibaba and AliExpress and been very happy with them. This is the BME280. It's uh, produced by Bosch. And it's an environment sensor. So it senses temperature, humidity, and pressure. A small note uh, about uh, finding uh, this component in the right place. The price range that we found for this component went from $2 to 30 to 35 dollars. So that's a 15 fold uh, uh, difference in price. But you have this, you decide you want this, you want to use it. Um, on the top left here, you have the sensor itself. So what you do is you uh, look for, you try to find the data sheet for this sensor, the BME, BME 280. And in the data sheet, you will normally find what's called a typical application circuit or a connection diagram. And this will help you to know how to um, introduce it into your design, into your PCB design. And what you see on the right here is someone has already designed what is that typical connection diagram, maybe a little bit different, and they offer it as a sensor module that you can connect directly to the microcontroller. So that's what that looks like, the PCB. A small word on communication protocols. I don't know how familiar you are with these. SPI and I2C are very popular standards. I can just say briefly that many sensors use one of these two. And it's not actually that uh, hard to learn how to use them. Many times, drivers for the components already exist. So then it becomes trivial how to use the sensor that you buy. OK. then. We know what components we want. We want to design the PCB. I checked the price for one of the leading commercial PCB design tools or suites that the corporate uh, domain uses, the bigger companies. 
And that start, the starter price was over $7,000 a year. So that doesn't suit our uh, taste as well, being hobbyists. So I'm going to briefly mention three free software that you can use. Um, there's been a proliferation of this uh, the last maybe five to ten years, which is excellent for us hobbyists. One is Fritzing. I haven't used this myself, but it's open source and free. It's a desktop application. Um, it has these nice pictures, as you can see, of the components, uh, which is helpful if you're not super familiar about what the names of these components are, the types. Uh, they also have a nice breadboard uh, prototyping design, um, which is nice if you want to kind of ma save your prototype design instead of taking a picture. And then you have something called ECEDA, which is also free. They have an online version and a desktop version. One cool feature with this program is that when you design when you have your circuit diagram made and you have your schematic and then you decide which type of specific components you want to use, you, the program will check availability for those components in LS, LCSC, the Chinese uh, distributor, and you, it will automatically create the bill of materials for you. So then when you're done, you can just, instead of clicking save, you can click order, and then you get all the things that you need to make it. And you can also, uh, it also includes uh, JLC PCB, which is a PCB manufacturer. Then on to the program that we've used. This is called KiCad, and it's uh, GPL licensed. It has a huge community. It's quite advanced. So since it has a huge community, it has tons of designs already available for you. So you can just add the BME 280 temperature sensor to your diagram and you're good to go. It also has a push and shove router, which means in the layout, when you draw the, the connections, how the physical connections are gonna be, it will push out existing connections if there's not enough room. So you don't have to redraw all the connections you made already, which is a nice feature. So how, how, what does the workflow look like? You start by drawing the schematic then you assign component footprints. Next, you draw the layout. You order the PCB and the components. You build it, and then you test it. And then it didn't work, of course. So you go and iterate again. You have to expect at least a couple, one or a couple uh, iterations. So the first part of drawing a schematic, this is what that looks like. It's a circuit diagram with the um, it's like a symbolic representation of your uh, circuits. So they will have standardized symbols. It will not be a, a realistic two-dimensional layout of how the PCB will be. But uh, since it's a schematic, it's the best way to actually understand the circuit. That's where you want to go if you want to learn about how it works. Then from the schematic, you want to assign footprints for each component that you have introduced. So a footprint would be how um, the component would fit onto the PCB. So for a resistor, for example, they have tons of different dimensions, tons of different uh, uh, physical designs. So the footprint would specify that physical design. There are so many available, you probably won't have to uh, draw your own footprint, but if you have to do that, it's actually quite simple to learn. Next, you have schematic, footprints. Now you're ready to make the actual physical layout. So that means you import whatever your schematic and uh, footprints, and you get all the components clustered in the middle. And then you have to place all the components where you want them to be on your, on your PCB. And you also draw all the connections between them. Here you have an example of a schematic to the left and a layout to the right. And the schematic, the yellow thing in the schematic corresponds to the uppermost uh, thing you can see on the layout. And then you can see some white lines there. And the white lines are indications of what you need to uh, connect with uh, tracks. So it will help you. You don't have to memorize how it was supposed to be connected. And lastly, some tools, including KiCad, has a 3D viewer. It's good 
to see how your product will look in the end. Maybe you're 3D designing an encase, a case for it, then it's useful to know. Plus, it just looks really cool, so it's a good motivation. You should always uh, check the 3D viewer if you want to go for one more hour. So, we've done the, we're finished with the design. Now it's time to order and assemble. You have many, many types of uh, PCB manufacturers. I list three of them because they are the ones I've been told about the most. Dirty PCBs, they are dirt cheap. Uh, they're good for projects if you, can, if you can allow or accept a higher margin of error because uh, uh, they're not so accurate, but they're very cheap. On the right, you have PCB way. They, have, they offer assembly in addition, so that, that's nice. And in the middle, you have JLC PCB, which is the one we used. Uh, we also uh, are sponsored by them. We got some coupons to help us out. And uh, yeah, uh, part of the demo was supposed to be designing an actual PCB from scratch and then ordering it from JLC PCB just to show how that you can actually do this in five or 10 minutes for a simple circuit. But alas, we don't have time for that, so we're gonna do something else. Now on to assembling. How do you assemble this that you have? You have hand soldering, which is very good for uh, prototyping simple circuits. Uh, some through hole components means that you push the component through the PCB and then solder it on the other side. Um, it's very good for troubleshooting. If something is not working, you maybe uh, take off one component. Um, so it's always good to have available, but you don't want to do the entire process using hand soldering. So I can quickly show you how that looks like. We're assembling the buttons here and then hand soldering them one by one. Okay. When you order your PCB, you might want to at the same time order a stencil. And what that is, it's a plate with holes where the PCB wants to have solder paste. So you put the PCB above, uh, below it, and then you apply solder paste, a very, very thin layer, on top of the stencil, just one go, and you have solder paste exactly on the pads where you're supposed to have it. So that looks like this. There are small, tiny silver pellets. On the top, you can see it's been uh, bridged. There's a bridge between it, and it's heat treated. And you have two ways of actually um, heating up that I know. You have hot air gun, and then you have this uh, reflow oven, which is very nice. You get a uniform heat. Everything attaches properly. Using an air, uh, hot air gun is uh, harder, but it's doable. We did both. Lastly, if you really want to go at it, you have a pick and place machine where you don't have to manually place all the components. You just have a machine to do it for you instead. If you have a high volume, then it might be uh, reasonable to do it. There's one at Bitroff, the makerspace in Oslo. They have one, so you can use. You can have a higher density of components, uh, but uh, as far as I know, you can only, only use it to connect surface-mounted components, and it also takes a, time, a little bit of time because you have to create the program to put it together. So this is what we came up with. Um, we wanted to make something uh, that was fun, that has a lot of components. And I can just quickly run through the physical layout. In the back, we have an ESP32 microcontroller, which has, this particular has eight megabytes of RAM, four megabytes of uh, flash. It's uh, 320, I think, megahertz dual, dual core processor, so it's pretty powerful. Here you have three and a half millimeter output. You have some breakouts here and here that you can uh, solder if you want. Looking at the front, then you have some input devices. You have the direction pad. You have an analog version of the direction pad. You have four buttons here. And then this is a nice feature with the ESP32. You can connect directly to the microcontroller one wire, and it, you can uh, configure it to be a touch sensor. So that's a small little touch pad. Here you have the BME280 environment sensor. This is a nine axis motion sensor. It's called MPU9250. You have a GPIO extender. 
Um, this is a micro SD card uh, reader. So this would be SPI, these would be I2C. Um, you have here a little preamp amplifier with a microphone, um, MEMS microphone it's called. You have the same circuit here with a speaker and an amplifier. You have four addressable RGB LEDs. And then you have the capacitive touch display in the middle here, which is 240 by 320, 9, 16-bit. Let's have a look at the schematic. This is how the schematic looks, looks like. Let's change the color. Here is the microcontroller. And then you have many different types of uh, devices. You can see that they're not physically connected. And that's because if you use a label, it says here Joy Y, and then you repeat that label, then that counts as a connection, Joy Y. So this is the thumb slide joystick. So that's very nice. So it doesn't look like one connected thing. Here we're zooming in at the BME 280. And here you can see um, it has two pins here, the clock pin connected to the microcontroller and the data pin. And the rest is just a copy paste from the application circuit. On to the layout, that looks like this. What you see here is the front and the back uh, of the PCB at the same time. So the front would be uh, the brown uh, wires there, they're the front, and the green is on the back. And also zooming in at the BME 280. We should have given it a little bit more space for the, for the text, but it works. Here is the 3D design for the first version that we made, and also the manufactured um, uh, PCB for the first and the second version. So we had to make three. For a small demo, we'll try. Let's see. So the demos, we're not going to write any code. We're just going to run a couple of demos instead. So I have to do it kind of, I have to uh, mirror my brain in order to get this to work. So you go up and down here for some choices. The first one is a Tetris clone called Tetrix. That is, this is uh, all written from scratch in, in MicroPython by a C++ programmer, Morten. He's very effective. Then the next one is a snake clone. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it goes when you mirror. The la next one is a weather report. So here you have temperature and humidity. The bar to your left would be the temperature. So, yeah. It updates, I think, every second. And you can go even further. And, of course, Morten made also a 3D dungeon game, which I don't... Can you see it? Yeah. Yes, yes, he's really good, but he doesn't like to share his code. Because <laughs> he's not a programmer, he's actually a uh, biotech guy. So he's not really, he hasn't been doing a lot of like collaboration. So he has weird uh, variable names and stuff. <laughs> so it has a little minimap at the bottom there. I'm not able to go, oh, okay. Here you can walk around. No ghosts there yet. And two more demos. This is a little vertical scroller platform thing. This is to demonstrate the, the hardware. Um, the display driver has this scrolling, hardware scrolling functionality. So you get a very nice frame rate. And then lastly, he made this. He made this uh, yesterday in a few hours just to give you an impression of how this high-level language can, can get you productive. So here you're using the capacitive touch and you're adjusting the brightness and the color. And then you can lock 
the LEDs. I just locked two of them. And then you can change the ones that are not locked. So yeah, that's a lot of fun. That was the demo. Now, how much? <laughs> Thank you. Um, how much did this cost? For components, it would be around 50 US dollars. I think we could push this down to maybe 40 or 45. But then you have to add value added tax if you're shipping it to Norway. Uh, the shipping itself, uh, some, you usually use DHL or UPS or something similar like that. That costs money. And what they also do is that they pay the value added tax on your behalf and then they add it to the bill. And of course, there's an extra fee for that, which could range from uh, 20 to $40 for every shipment. Um, we also went through a lot of prototypes. You had to uh, make some prototypes, build them. You're not going to be able to sell them, obviously. And also, we had quite a few manufacturer er errors. We tried to assemble it. Something didn't work, a short circuit, something like that. But we're selling them right now uh, for 79 euros. So if you have some, uh, someone at home, some teenager that wants to learn how to code, or it's fun for a grown-up, I can promise you that as well. Uh, we're sold out by right now, but we're producing more. OK, so let's talk about how we failed. You have the design fails. If you see the micro SD card reader, there's something wrong there. It's because in the design, we, uh, it's upside down. So now you're not able to, uh, to put in a micro SD card or remove it if you already assembled the 3D printed uh, D-pad. <laughs> And then for the thumb slide right below, here's the layout for the first version. You guys see a problem here? Yeah. The, what happens here is that these circles are through hole circles. So it's actually cutting one of the tracks here. And that's one of the lessons. If you see it on top, there's a small ladybug seg uh, symbol. That's a design rules check. So if you click that, it would actually pop up. You have an error here. So we learned how to use that button after this. This is the push buttons in the uh, middle, the four push buttons. We wanted some sort of, uh, uh, to be able to use conductive rubber to push down and it would short circuit this grid-like uh, thing here. If you see the ground goes down to this part, should be the ground, but then it also connects here to the other side. So it's already uh, one or zero. It's already uh, connected uh, in the wrong way. So for all of the version two PCBs, we had to manually cut this out. Uh, we had assembly fails too, don't worry. Uh, this is Morten. We, when, we, when you get the uh, components, you usually get them in a cut strip, like a strip with that you open up. And we wanted all the resistor values available and wanted it in the, in the small boxes because when you assemble it, it's nice to be able to just use pliers and put it instead of opening up the strip. So we spent the whole day uh, putting these into boxes and the next day I managed to drop it in the floor. <laughs> and what happens there? Of course, all the resistor values blend together and we don't have C Cinderella on our team. So that was a sad face. Uh, some soldering issues. We used, at the start, a hot air gun, which is great, but it kind of localizes the heat. So the heat dissipates very quickly. Uh, if you put too much solder paste on uh, the stencil, what you're going to have is you're going to bridge some of the pads there. So we had a short circuit. Pads were bridged. And what you do then is that you use flux, and then you, uh, you apply your solder tip downwards and downwards uh, along the pads. And eventually, you will uh, remove the bridge. But since we have four layers, the upper copper layer is very fragile. So if you use too much force, you're just going to tear all the pads. Yeah, we had the same issue with the display. As you can see, it was uh, not easy at the start. We were also learning. Hans is the only guy who actually has some experience. Um, 
Yeah, so with this issue, especially with the MPU 9250, happened a lot because it, it's much smaller than the other uh, sensors. So here you have a graveyard of uh, defect uh, devices. Yeah, to make matters worse, we both got quite serious uh, repetitive strain injuries. So um, I was out. I had uh, issues with my elbows, cubital tunnel syndrome. I still do. And Hans had issues more like carpal and muscle stuff. He tried to make a nice uh, setup, ergonomic setup. But we were struggling. We were really struggling for this workshop at NDC. But we were so, we were so uh, lucky that people, the very last week, people showed up. Uh, every day, people showed up to help us assembling it, um, testing it with the design. They helped us write the tutorials for the workshop. And at the end, we had some controllers ready, ready to ship, packed it up, and we had our workshop. Not as many people as uh, we were worried might show up, uh, which is great. But it, I think everyone uh, had a great time. We, uh, people get so enthusiastic and immersed when they have physical things they can uh, interact with, with code. And people were skipping uh, coffee breaks. Actually, more than half of the coffee breaks we were just sitting in, listening to some house music and, and coding. The presentation we had to cancel because uh, our, so much pain after the workshop, but that's this presentation. So I'm very happy to get the chance to <laughs> present here at NDC Tech Town. Lastly, um, we have some tips and tricks for you. Let's just go through first the component sourcing process. Uh, use aggregators like Octopart. You get the best price for the component that you want to use. Buy at least two samples, that's important, at least. We bought the displays from China, it took a while to get it, and then the first thing we did was to destroy the first sample by plugging the microcontroller the wrong way. Find proper documentation for your components, go through data sheets, it's readily available, and check if there's uh, someone who already made a driver for the component, then it's very simple to just start using it. Ensure availability, reliability. If you find a component, make sure that they have enough that you need and that um, they are reliable enough that if you actually need to have a workshop ready, then uh, make sure that they're, they're trustworthy, that they have, uh, they're reputable, I would say. And lastly, consider lead time. So for the displays, when we were ready, we tested the samples. Yes, we got it to work. We want now 100 displays. OK, that's going to be four weeks lead time because they have to produce them first. So that was a problem for us. Luckily, they had enough in stocks for the ones that we made. For the PCB design, consider using a dedicated ground and VCC layers. So for us, that would mean we have four copper layers. Uh, the top and the bottom is for signals. And then in the middle, you have one cop uh, ground layer and one VCC layer. That makes it very simple if you have a component you're supposed to connect to ground here and here, you just send it straight to that layer. Then place surface mounted uh, components on one of the layers, either top or the bottom, because you're going to place all these at once and you're going to put it in the oven. And then you don't want to have to flip it and do it again. If you are unsure where to connect your pin, um, some of these pin has something called an I square C address. You, should I pull this pin to, th to uh, VCC or to some other pin, you can just make a track for both of them and make uh, like a zero ohm resistor footprint. And then when you're ready to assemble it, you just put a zero ohm resistors on one of them. So you actually close the circuit on one of them, keep the one other open. Add capacitors. If it wasn't for capacitors, you could just take copy paste all of the schematics from the data sheets and it would work. And with Without capacitors, it might work, but you want to add capacitors uh, close to where uh, the components that drain some uh, power to make sure you don't get power spikes and stuff like that. Perform electrical and design rules check. That's the little ladybug in the schematic and the layout. And also, uh, there's a Inkscape plugin called SVG to Shenzhen, where you can make your design in SVG, and you can import it as a uh, PCB design file. And you can make some crazy designs. Some examples are here. 
assembly. If you're in doubt, use Flux. Flux uh, help makes your life easier. It's that secret sauce that you put to uh, make sure that everything solders nice and easy. It's also easy to remove parts using Flux. If your solder paste is dry, which in our case it was, it messed up our MPU's motion sensor, you can mix some Flux in there. That will help. Do not over apply solder paste on the stencil. You get too much solder, that, uh, more than you need. Use proper tools. Use a proper soldering iron that really helps uh, along, and then write test firmware so that when you assemble it, you know, I can test it, check immediately what works and what does not work. Lastly, when you're done with all this, uh, you thought it was fun, learning experience, but you don't want to have to open up a web shop, you don't want to have to produce. There's something, there's some ser service providers that offer you everything. You just give them the design file, they will manufacture the PCB for you, they will source the components for you. You just give them a bill of materials. They will find where to buy them. They will assemble them for you. They will keep it in stock for you. They will have a web shop. So they handle sales and they also handle distribution, usually from China. So then it's a free shipping uh, as well. That would also um, uh, get rid of the value added tax, I think. So it's a really nice uh, way. We haven't done that yet, but we're considering it if we get a big uh, like order book. And Makerfabs is one of the companies that I heard about. So that was the end of uh, the presentation. I hope you learned something. We definitely learned a lot along the way. Uh, mistakes are OK to do. You can expect it. But you're not going to probably find yourself in a deadlock where you can never get past it. It is actually absolutely doable. And when you have a, this device in your hand, it feels great. Thank you very much.